community in the experience of the LGBTI and creates the peace. Right? Creates the peace. It's through this process, this being the work, creates the peace. It's through this process then that members of the external, outside of the art, artist and herself, can consume that. Wow, wow, I can see myself in that work. I can see myself. I understand now. And what ends up happening is that we eventually attain a sense in which we have recognition. Right? This is this is what art does, right? Really good art lets us recognize things that were always there, that have always been there, but have been either historically, deliberately, institutionally masked. And it brings those it brings those recognitions to the surface, to light. That's what very highly contextualized art does. Right? So the last bit, um, the work of a, quote, pure free world subject is art. Everything that a free world subject does is artistic. The product of his or her labor is artistic because he or she, they have that, quote unquote, X factor. There's, there's, there's something about the individual that makes them different from others. And it's the freedom of their thought. Right? Their, their thought is wholly disconnected from any sort of institutional indoctrination, which allows a, a huge sense of flexibility. And that sense of flexibility is the condition with which we create art. Right? So art is a consequence of the effort work of the pure free will subject. And then lastly, the very nature of the subject's unbridled freedom is a source of art. Right? It's, it's because of the artist's freedom why the individual creates the work. Right? The, this is the this is the product. This is the final product. The manifestation of the piece, the work, is the final product, as objectively represented in the world, of the artist's internal subjective experience. Right, the artistic, the artistic product, is the final representation in the world of that subjective experience. Right, so in a sense, if you think about it with respect to this lecture series as an example, after I'm long dead and gone, after I'm old and gray. There will be a sense in which this work, this effort, remains within the world. Because what I've done is I've, I've, I've taken the subjective experience and posited it objectively in the world. What the artist does is exactly that, right? The, the artist creates. Um, it's almost like, you know, a quick, quick tangent, and I'll stop at this point. It's almost like um, in the, the Potter series, the Horcrux, right? The idea of the Horcrux is Voldemort, this is, I'm getting really nerdy here, really geeky, but what Voldemort does is he puts himself, his subjective experience, in objective things. This is the Horcrux, right? So he'll put part of his subjective experience in a snake. He'll put part of his subjective experience in, in a charm, in a talisman, right? This idea is a very old idea. It's, it's really the idea that embodies any concept of immortality is that your subjective experience is crystallized, if you will, within the objective world. The way that you do that is through work, right? Your work is the product, is the means by which you objectify your subjective experience. So after I'm dead and gone for decades, for hundreds of years, for, for tens of thousands of years, there is a sense in which the very, very skilled, the very, very attuned, can create sort of that, there is a sense in which art becomes immortal. The artist is immortalized by the work. Right? We've heard that before, right? And the question is, how is the artist immortalized by the work? Because the artist, the, the artist, I don't want to use, the, the artist captures, posits his or her subjectivity in the objective world, right? And that's, that's, that, undermines this sort of arbitrary subject-object distinction, right? The, the easy way of understanding is, oh, there's a subject, there's an object. The more profound way of assessing it and making sense of it is that the artist and the work of art is a means of transcending this distinction. It's also a means of attaining immortality that's not sort of what Nietzsche would, would gasp at, sort of personal biological immortality. And this was his critique, I think, in Note 170. Right? This is a means of attaining that sense of objective resilience 
by informing the objective with the subjective, right? The free will of the purely subjective um, experience of the artist is infused within the objective world as the product art. So, uh, very, very, very powerful stuff. Um, if you're an artist or an aspiring artist, I hope that you know you make sense of this because it is it is the means with which you distinguish sort of you know okay art from really 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 good art. It's not an easy thing to lecture on. It's not an easy thing to formulate. But I think the idea of the Horcrux will help a lot because there's a contemporary discourse on that, and people know and seen the movies, have read the books. Um, and that's exactly what it is, right? It's that attempt. It's the relationship between the subject and object via the work. And me, my work is this, right? This is the way in which the subjective becomes objective, right? In which the individual infuses him or herself within the social, not the other way around, right? So hopefully that makes, uh, hopefully that makes sense. And this, this is going to conclude uh, section 10.6 of Nietzsche's will to power. I'm going to continue with, uh, what's next, I think section 11, section 11, and then we're going to start, uh, and we're going to start a, a slightly different uh, discourse. It will still pertain to sort of art in the aesthetic, but this is just a brief sort of segue from Nietzsche's sort of traditional discourse, which we'll get back to in a little bit, but uh, very, very interested in his aesthetic discourse. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Thanks, and have a good day.